meant to live, and I was meant to live. Now, at first hearing something like that, you might ask, what do you mean, living the life I was meant to live? I mean, I'm living life now. Aren't I meant to live this life? Well, if you're a believer, maybe not. And if you're not a believer, definitely not. Okay. And I can hear some saying, well, Pastor Bill, please explain. When we think about it, God has made great plans for you and for me. And like I say, I don't think we often think about it. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read these words. And I think you'll better understand it after they're read. You might want to turn there in your Bibles, in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. And then it goes on to say, just as he chose us in him, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now think about that thought. God, before the universe was, actually chose us in Christ that you and I, now here in space and time, might be holy and blameless. That's why he chose us. What an incredible thought. Now, you weren't chosen to live a boring life or a drab life, or a meaningless life, or a purpose, purposeless or empty life. You weren't chosen to live a fearful life, an anxious life. You were chosen to live a holy and blameless life. And that life is a joyful life, an abundant life, a victorious life, a meaningful life, with a great present despite difficulties, and the most incredible future ahead. That's why you and I were chosen. But are we living the life we were chosen to live? You see, God has a blueprint for every life. Before our conversion, before we accepted Christ, he mapped out our career before us. Our responsibility is to find out what that is and then to obey it. We don't have to work out a plan for our life, but only accept the plan that he has drawn up for us. You know, when we know we don't have to work out a plan for our life and that he's made one already, I tell you, this delivers us from fret and frenzy and ensures us that our lives will be of maximum glory to Him. It will be the most blessing to others and the greatest reward to ourselves. And I ask you again, are you living the life you are meant to live? The life God has planned for you from all eternity. And I ask myself, that very question this morning. Well, in order to live out what God has planned for us, I think there are some things we should be doing. The first thing is, you and I, if we're going to live the life that God has planned for us, should be confessing and forsaking sin. Now, that's exactly what we did this morning. Confessing and forsaking sin. Any sin that we are conscious of in our life. Do you know that sin in your life and in my life interrupts God's plan for us? Sin interrupts God's plan for us. So what he has planned for us comes to a halt when we entertain sin in our life. It's amazing when we think about it. I want to ask you this morning, 
has God's plan for your life come to a halt? If there's anything in your life that you need to deal with this morning. You know, David dealt with that. Remember Psalm 32.5. It was a confession psalm. David who committed adultery. David who was responsible for the murder of Uriah's, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. He was a murderer, he was an adulterer, and, but he did something that we all need to do. Deal with our sin immediately. Turn to Psalm 32.5. Psalm 32.5. And I'm sure you've turned to this psalm many times and read it over and over again. Because it reminds us of something we need to do. David said, I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, I want you to know certain things there. Number one, he acknowledges sin. He didn't hide it. He acknowledged it. Number two, he confessed it. And number three, God forgave it. We have to acknowledge our sin and not hide it. We don't candy coat it. We don't rationalize it. We acknowledge it before God. God, I have sinned against you. God, this is stopping your plan from going forward in my life. The plan that you've planned for me from all eternity, and I recognize that, and I confess it to you now. I want to get right with you, and David did. He confessed it. The New, Te New Testament equivalent of that scripture might be 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you know, it's not enough to confess your sin. It's not enough to acknowledge your sin. You say, what do you mean it's not enough? That's pretty good to me. Oh no, we need to forsake our sin. We need to forsake our sin. Proverbs 28, 13 tells us that he who conceals his transgression will not prosper but the one who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Dear friends, we are called to put it behind us. We are called to forsake our sin. Because so very so often we acknowledge it, we confess it, but guess what? The next day we're doing it all over again. Are we really forsaking our sins? You know what? You and I can experience God's plan for our life, that He's planned for us from all eternity, unless we're confessing our sins and forsaking our sins. Secondly, if we're going to live the life that God's planned for us, we need to be constantly and continually yielded to Him. Remember the hymn, I Surrender All? Great hymn. We need to be yielded to Him, not my will, but your will. So I, I guess a question we can ask ourselves, and I can ask myself, am I, are you living a surrendered life? Now, come on, let's be honest with ourselves. I don't think I always am. And I think maybe some of you can say, well, probably not. Am I surrendering all? I always say we have those pet sins that we like to hang on to. We rationalize them. We say, oh, they're not so bad, and... You know, we give God a story and say, God, really, it's really not that bad. I'm okay with this. You know, I can handle this. And so on. when we know in our heart's heart, God doesn't want us to be involved in that. God doesn't want us to be thinking those thoughts. God doesn't want us to be doing those things. How can I be yielded to Him when there's something in my life that's stopping the flow of His power and His life in me? Impossible. I need to be constantly yielded. Now, Paul knew that, Romans 12. He said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, God. This is your reasonable service. In chapter 6, verse 13, it says, present yourself to God and your members, your bodily members, your bodily parts as instruments of righteousness. I, I like to say to folks when I counsel, when they're struggling with some sin, present your body parts to God. Say, Lord, I give you my hands today that they might only do things that are pleasing to you. Lord, I give you my eyes today, 
that I only may choose to see things that are pleasing to you. Lord, I give you my ears today that I only may listen to things pleasing to you. Lord, I give you my feet today that I might only go in places you'd want me to be. Lord, I give you my thoughts today that I only might think those thoughts that are pleasing to you. Give your members to God. Give yourself to God. They said, boy, that's a great help. And Romans 6 talks about that. You might want to read that. It's a blessing. So what does it mean to be continually yielded to Him? Well, it also says in that next verse, to renew our minds, that we might prove that it is acceptable to God, to be conformed, not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind, giving Him our body, a living sacrifice, not a dead one. We're a living sacrifice, and we renew our minds. We're told to walk in the Spirit, and walk by the Spirit, Galatians 5.16. I say, walk by the Spirit. If you do that, what will happen? You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Also, abiding in Him. Jesus said, if you abide in Me and My words abide in you, you're going to bear much fruit. And He says, you know what? Your prayers will be answered too. Your prayers will be answered too. John 15, 4 and 7. Also, walking as Jesus walked. The one who says he abides in me ought to walk as he walked. You see, Jesus, when we talk about this life that he's planned for us from all eternity, is patterned after his son Jesus. Jesus is our model. He's our goal. We're to be conformed to his image. So, dear friend, if you and I are to live that life which God has planned before the worlds began for each one of us, and he's planned them uniquely, for each one of us, we need to be constantly and unconditionally yielded to Christ. Thirdly, if we're going to live that life which He's planned for us, we need to study the Word and discern what the will of God is. We need to study His Word and discern what the will of God is. And then, once we know what it is, actually do it. Actually do it. I love that portion in Ephesians. You might want to turn to Ephesians 5 for a moment because it talks about that. It talks about the fact that we are to make it a point to know the will of God. Look at 15 through 17. Therefore, Paul is speaking here, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but wise. Okay? Making the most of your time. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How do we understand what the will of the Lord is? By going to the book that talks about God's will for our life. By spending time in Scripture. That's the only book in the universe that talks about what God's will is for our life. And the most important thing that you and I can do in this life as we can consider what God's plan for us from all eternity is to understand what His will is for you and for me. And then put it into practice. We need to do that. I love the prayer that Paul prays for the Colossian saints in chapter 1. You might want to turn there for a moment. And Paul prays for them that they might know the will of God because he knows that's absolutely the most important thing for them to know. Starting at verse 9 in chapter 1 of Colossians, he says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled, what does he say? With the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's a great prayer to pray for other Christians. Lord, I pray that Judy, that Sal, that Frank, that Bob might be filled with the knowledge of your will. Of course, the way they're going to do that is to get into the Word of God. 
and study it and meditate on it. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Richly. Now, why would he pray a prayer like that for them? That they might be just filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. And verse 10 tells us why he prayed that. So that, so when you see that so that, or in order to, it tells us the reason why. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. There is also stresses increasing in the knowledge of God again in the very next verse. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You see, if He's planned our lives from the foundation of the world, if that's His goal for us, when we study His Word and live it out, we are going to do what it says here. We're going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So we have to ask ourselves the question, Am I walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? Am I seeking to please Him in all respects? You say, hmm. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, those are pretty haunting questions for the Christian today. We often are more influenced by the world, aren't we? To please Him in all respects. But you might say, well, how am I going to do this? That's a pretty tall order. Verse, 10, verse 11 tells us, Strengthen with all power according to His glorious might. That's how you're going to do it. And that's how I'm going to do it. Not in our own strength, but strengthened with all His power. By the indwelling Holy Spirit, you, can, uh, you and I can live that life that is pleasing to the Lord. We can please Him in all respects. We can walk in a manner worthy of Christ. We can live that life that God has planned for us by His power working in and through us. What a wonderful prayer. But we did say, now once you know the will of God, by getting into the Word of God, you do it. You do it. Very often we say, oh man, I enjoy that Bible study. Oh man, that was so insightful. I love that. Love the insights I got. Can't wait to play that DVD again. Or watch that TV program, whatever. Man, I took notes you wouldn't believe. Sadly enough, in many cases, perhaps in most, it really doesn't change a thing in that person's thinking and life. And it's sad. Or maybe it does for a week, for two, possibly three. And then it just seems to fizzle away that insight that he gave us. What happened to it? Now we're to put it into practice. I love that story when Jesus is with his disciples and they were eating. And he gets that basin of water. And he does that job, which is the job of the lowest household servant. Starts washing their feet. Pretty stinky job, actually. And you know, Peter, when he saw this, like the Lord himself washing our feet. He gets over to Peter. Peter says, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. The Lord says, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you have no part with me. Wow. Christ set a marvelous example. And he says, if I, your master and your teacher, wash your feet, you should also do it too. The key verse for me is John 13, 17. After he really gave them an example of service and humility, he says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. That's the key. You are blessed if you do them. Only doing the Word of God brings blessing. Not just knowing it, not studying it alone, but actually doing it. And that brings the blessing in our life. So if we're going to live the life that God has planned from all eternity... We need to study the Word of God to know the will of God, then do it. Num number four, this, a lot of these seem like no-brainers as we go through this, but you know what? They are. But in practice, they're not. Because I think I do and a lot of Christians suffer 
from actually not doing the very essential at times. Number four is spend time in prayer each day. You know, we cannot know or live out God's will in our life unless we're having regular prayer. Not just Sunday morning as the pastor prays. Not even Wednesday night coming to prayer meeting. No. It's going to be a daily part of our life for many reasons. We're in spiritual warfare, for one. Number two, you and I cannot live we cannot grow spiritually without prayer. Colossians 4.2 says it strongly, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. We should be devoted to prayer. Prayer should be our devotion. Ephesians 6.18, Paul says this, with all prayer. And I like verse 18. If you've got a literal translation of the Bible, you've got four alls. I like to call them the four alls of prayer. In there, in Ephesians 6, 18, listen to the alls. With all prayer and petition at all times, in the Spirit, and in view of this, be on the alert with all perseverance, and then petition for all the saints. You and I should be praying at all times for one another, and they should be praying for us. We should be on the alert for one another. We should be persevering in our prayer for one another. Dear friends, if we are going to live that life that God has planned for us, you and I must be people of prayer. Now we have to look at our own life and ask the question, am I a Christian, a praying Christian? I mean, not a Christian who prays, we all do once in a while, but I'm I truly a praying Christian. Am I devoting myself to prayer, as Colossians 4.2 tells us? And we raise these questions, we might come to the realization maybe we're not living in its fullness the plan that God has ordained for us from the foundation of the world. Also, number five, seize the opportunities for service. Dear friend, if you and I are going to live that full life that he's planned for us, we need to seize the opportunities that God gives us for service. I love what it says in Galatians 6.10, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of God. Let's do good to all. Let's do good to everyone, but especially those who are the saints, especially those who are of the household of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at Titus. Titus is a small book, but it's a book that talks a lot about good works. And I love the scripture. Titus 2.7, you might want to jot these down because it reminds us that our life should be a life of good works. Titus 2.7, show yourself to be an example in good deeds. Show yourself to be an example in good deeds. And we raise the question, is my life an example in good deeds? Whoops. Titus 3.8, those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men and for women too. The fact is, we need to be engaging in good deeds. We need to be careful to be doing this in our lives. Titus 3.14. Exactly my point. Titus 3.14. Our people must learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so they will not be unfruitful. So they will not be unfruitful. Dear friends, unless our life is filled with good deeds, we will be unfruitful. We will not be living out that plan that God has planned for each of our lives from the foundation of the world. I like what John Wesley he had a rule about this. John Wesley wrote these words. Do all you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. A lot of cans in there, but the fact is we get the point. 
He was a person who believed in living a fruitful life. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, These are the works that He's prepared for us beforehand. God has prepared for us from the foundation of the world to do good works. If we're going to live that life planned for us for all eternity, we need to seize the opportunity. Look at it this way. God prepares you and me for good works. Okay? Think about it. God prepares you and me for good works. Secondly, He prepares good works for us to perform. Ephesians 2.10. And then thirdly, He rewards us when we perform them. He rewards us when we perform them. And finally, cultivate fellowship and counsel with other believers. If you and I are going to live the lives we were meant to live, cultivate fellowship and counsel with other believers. Dear friends, we need one another. If you read in the New Testament, no Christian was meant to be a lone ranger, to be isolated. We are meant to be a body who prays together, studies together, worships together, laughs together, cries together. We're all together. Cultivate that fellowship and counsel. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, we read these words. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you. Why? That you may have fellowship with us. That you may have fellowship with us. And that should be our goal. We're wanting other believers to have fellowship with us. Then he goes on to say, And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. So our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. You come as a believer and you have fellowship with us. God planned for us to have fellowship together. And that means a Hebrews 10.25. That's not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and more so as you see the day approaching. That's the coming of Christ. Well, in summary then, are you living the life you were meant to live? The life God that planned for all eternity. Well, if you are, then you're confessing and you're forsaking your sins. You're trying to constantly and unconditionally yield yourself to God. I surrender all. You're studying God's word to know his will. And then once you find it, you actually do it. You do what he tells you to do. You're spending time in prayer each day. Prayer is the breath of our spiritual life. We can't breathe without it. Five, we seize the opportunities of service. And God will bring them our way. And six, we cultivate fellowship and good counsel, wise counsel with believers. Dear friends, He chose you and He chose me in Christ from the foundation of the world that we should live holy and blameless lives. And once again, I ask you and myself, are we living that life that God has planned from all eternity for us that we should be living in time? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for its truth. And Lord, may we desire to live that life that you've planned for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.